Hi, and welcome to episode 19 of my free Java video course. My name is Markus Biel. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the method clone of the class object. The class object, as said before, is the superclass of all the objects in the Java universe. And this is why you can use the method clone in all your objects. Now the question is, should you really? And the short answer is, you should not, at least generally speaking. And this is similar to the finalize method that we talked about in the last episode, which is again the reason why I'm talking about clone today, because in this aspect, they're both quite similar. Okay, but before going in more details, maybe first of all, we should clarify what actually does the clone method do. And clone, as the name implies, it creates an identical copy of the object that you call clone on. So what it does not do is if you have an object, you can always assign it a second or third, how many references ever you want. The problem is with the references that when you work on this reference, all other references will have will be influenced by your changes. And sometimes this is not what you need. You want an independent copy. And for this reason, you could use the clone method. However, there are actually better alternatives, which I'll tell you later. But now, enough of talking anyway. Let's jump into my IDE and look at the code. Okay, so. Here you see my Porsche test. You might remember the Porsche and the other cars from my earlier episodes. Um, before I show you the nasty stuff, I wanted to show you one case where actually I think using clone is actually good. And this is here. I have prepared an array of strings. One, two, three. And here, I mean, array is also an object. So the also has the clone method and for the string for the array it was already implemented the way it should be so you can and you should clone your array so I can say string copied array equals to array dot clone and then I can assert not same, which means this check checks now if we just have a reference. In this case, it would be the same. Array and copied array. Which, to show you the difference, I can also call assert same and use twice the same reference so this should be true. This should with not also be true. So there are two different instances. You see, it finished with a green bar. This is what we want to see. So it seems array and array compared to itself, it's both the same reference. They're both referring to the same object, but the copy, is not the same reference, it's not the same object, it is a new object. And now, I mean, I want to make this short, but I want to show you at least system out print ln. And then, you know, this is not. I just want to show you the first element, and then I just hope you believe me, or you can do it at home can print out the whole elements in in an in a loop now i'm just showing you the first element of my copy and you see it's one so the other ones are also or i might just as well otherwise you tell me copied array this way you also learn how you can print out a whole array. And this is now 
can print out str. And this will then in a loop, in a for each loop, print out all the strings for us. So I hope this is working now. One, two, three, C. Okay, so for now this should be enough. This was just a sh very short demonstration of a good case of clone. Actually, I found on the internet a very interesting article. Actually, it's a newsletter article from Dr. Heinz Kabutz. He's really a very cool guy. I love his newsletters. Um, and he actually made a test and found out that clone for very small arrays might be a bit shorter, uh, slower. However, for large arrays, it's actually faster than any other method. Well, can't go in more detail, we don't have the time and this is also very, very advanced already and we're still on beginner level, approaching more advanced. So anyway, let's continue with our Porsche. And this is now really test-driven style programming because I start with an empty test, the code is not finished, we start with writing a test, the test will first of all be read and then we are working our way to get the test screen. Okay, so I say Porsche Porsche equals to new Porsche. Actually, this is something you can't know. Before doing this episode, I have extended, uh, adjusted my class a bit. I mean, you might remember the Porsche from my last episodes because it was empty initially. There was no attributes, no instance members. So. This I had to change because I want to show you something that we copy. So I added a string and I said it's the owner, the name of the owner. And well, which name should I choose? Because I always wanted to own a Porsche. I thought I might just as well make me the owner of the Porsche. And because you probably also want to own a Porsche, I thought I should make you the owner of our copy, of our clone. because. I will not give you my Porsche, but I might just as well copy mine and then give you this copy. Well, in real world, this is pretty much impossible. However, here in Java, see how easy that is. The only problem we have is, I don't know your name. So for this example, I just assume your name is Peter. So I say Peter's Porsche equals to new Porsche. But this is not what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to clone. Yeah, because this is now easy. <laughs> I can just say Peter. And then you have your Porsche. But this is not the original idea. So let's remove that. And now let's say Porsche.clone. And interesting enough, really, I mean, we can't see what happens behind the covers because this is done really by the JVM and we don't care too much <laughs> as long as it works. But there is never a constructor actually called. So this is really internally copied from the memory. It's just, see, we still have this red, something is still wrong. I mean, I said we start with a not working test. So it says clone has protected access and Java lang object. And this is something we have to fix. So the method, this says the method is already there. The problem is it's not visible to us because it is protected. Protected would be visible in the same package. The class object is in the package java lang as I showed you last time, but here we are in a different package. Also my Porsche test does not inherit anything from Porsche because this is from Porsche so I can't use clone in here. Okay, but what I can and what I will do I can override the original clone method, but still I want the code, the implementation of the class object. But let's already jump into the Porsche class. So I will override it, public Porsche, because I want it to return a Porsche to me. Clone. And then you might still remember from my last episode we can and we should put override here to have a check from the compiler side 
that we actually did everything correctly. Now let me format that. Okay, and you see there's nothing red, so it seems like so far everything is fine. Well actually, one, inter one interesting thing is the original implementation says object, because in object what could you return? You don't know the object, but the method always is exactly copying whatever object there is, and in our case we have a Porsche, so it is, so it is also fine to directly make this return a Porsche. But now we have an empty implementation and we have to return a Porsche. Well, we could say return new Porsche, but again, this would not be a clone. So this would, our test would fail in this case. So this is not what we can do. So we have to say super. Super means um, I want to call a method from super class, in this case object. And you see already here, I see clone. It's actually the first method because my IDE is already smart. It knows the name of this method is clone. So it assumes I want to call super clone. Okay, so, and then I want to return it. So all we did so far is we override the method and then again we said, well, actually, I don't really want to override it. All I want is I want to use the method of class object. So all we did so far is we made the visibility public so that we're able to use it. This is all we did so far. But now you see there is still a problem. Unhandled exception, Java lang, clone not supported exception. And this is already in my opinion a flaw because like why does this now throw a clone not supported exception if we do support clone? So anyway, this is how it is. And now we have to fix that. The way we fix that is we say try, because there is an exception that could happen. And we will catch the exception. Catch. And there my IDE again helps me, clone not supported exception. I usually give it the name E. Okay, now what should we do here? Some people say return null because we have to return something. This is just the signature forces us to return something, but this is not so nice. I mean, actually we assume this is hopefully never happening, but if it for whatever reason is happening, we really want to see that it is a problem. So in this case, and I kind of copied that from Josh Block, um, because again, my episode here about clone is based on his book, Effective Java, second edition. And it was exactly the same with the finalized episode. So I can only give you a short introduction to the topic. Um, Josh Block, in his book, he has like, I think, eight pages only on the clone method. Um, you should really buy the book and read it. So for this, you can go to marcus-biel.com, click on must reads. And there you'll find the book and you can buy it directly. Yeah, also all the books in the must read section. I mean, I have picked the name for a reason. Those are really books. I want you to read them all. They're really classics. The best of the best, best Java books you could find, in my opinion at least. So if you trust me, buy that book and read it. Okay, anyway, so what he did and what I will do the same is he said, throw new assertion error. Because if this happens, this is not even an exception, this is really an error. We really have a big problem here if we get this clone not supported exception. Okay, so this here now seems fine, but there's still something wrong. And this is, it says I'm calling super.clone. And as I told you, this is the method from object and object returns an object, at least from the signature of the method. But we are smarter, we know actually it's safe to, to say Porsche because this object, I mean the super type is object, but the subtype is a Porsche. So we do an explicit cast and we cast it to Porsche. This is safe here. Um, yeah, if it was not safe, it would throw a class not support, uh, class cast exception, sorry. But in this case, believe me, we'll see, It'll it should work. Okay, well. Are we done? It 
looks like we were. Well, actually, as I said, this method is flawed, so we are not done. We still have to do some more thing. But this I want to see. I mean, my idea was to implement the method, I did that. So now let's go back to our test. You see, everything is, um, well, I can't say green, but the red stuff has gone. So I can execute the test. But I haven't asserted anything yet. So the first assert that I want to do is I want to assert not same. This is just a shorter handy form of saying not equal. So it would be the same if we say Porsche not equal to Porsche, Peter's Porsche. Because the idea is that when my clone worked that I have a new object. And because it's good to have a method that already from the method name tells us what it does. I use this one and I compare now Porsche to Peter's Porsche. So my first test is just asserting that this reference here is not referencing this Porsche here now, but something else. This is in our first test all I want to achieve. Okay, so I execute the test. And BAM! You see the assertion error? I said, well, everything will be saved, la 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 la, when it's not. And this is why tests are so great. Yes. And now we can see what happened and think about why did this happen. Okay, so by jumping here, see, line 28, I see this happened. The problem is here in this case, without further knowledge, it would really be hard to know why this happened. So here, sorry, I have to help a bit. The thing is, I mean, I told you this method is flawed. It's not enough to use the power of inheritance here. On top, you have to use, you have to implement an interface here. So we are already implementing car, but for interfaces, I told you in the episode about interfaces, we can implement several interfaces. So here I have now to implement the clonable interface from Java Lang also. Now, funny enough, implementing the, the interface, normally I would expect that I would have to implement some method. Well, in this case, it's different. We don't have to implement anything. And this is a specific case. This interface we call a marker interface. So this interface is actually empty. There's nothing in there. It just tells the JVM, I'm implementing clonable, so you can call clonable here. It's a clone here, it works. And this is a bit awkward because normally when you implement an interface, um, you would, on the reference now, like I can now say that I implement clonable, I can also make this a clonable so that my Peter's Porsche now plays the role of being a clonable. The problem is this doesn't help me anything. I don't have the method clonable here. All I have is the other methods of the class object, which we're not using now. So, because I can also say car, I mean, I'm implementing also the car interface, and then I can call the methods of car, which is drive plus all the methods of class object. Okay, well about markers interface, that's also another topic. Uh, this is a design pattern. Haven't talked much about design patterns yet. A marker interface really has good uses. So a marker interface, generally speaking, is not bad. It just here in this case, it's a bit weird that you have to implement a marker interface and then on top you have to override the method. Okay, so. I make this Porsche again, but now, and now the assert same is already again working because otherwise you could not compare different things. Let's try it again. And see, now we have the green bar, process finished with exit code. So my first assumption is correct. Peter's Porsche is not the same instance as Porsche. Okay, so 
Now I want to see who is the owner at the moment of Peter's Porsche. Peter's Porsche dot S string. And this is why before I prepared this method, because it returns Porsche off plus the owner's name. Because at the moment we don't have another way of seeing the content of owner's name. So I wrote this method to see who is owning it at the moment. Okay. And my expectation when we're finished is that the name would be Peter. So I would say it should return Porsche off Peter. So let's write a test for this. Assert equals first the expectation. Here you also see it expected. So I'm expecting it to say Porsche of Peter. Okay. And then comma and I put here Porsche dot as string, which is calling the method. So I expect the method to return Porsche of Peter. Later on, I mean, there's also again a method called equals. In an, a later episode, I'll talk about this and we will have a better way of comparing that. For now, I'm using the string method because we haven't talked about the equals method yet. So there's still something missing. Okay, I can remove that. So let me also execute this test now and it should be read. Yeah. Oh, there is <laughs> an error. I have missed a semicolon. Again, sorry. Yeah, comparison failure. Expected Porsche of Peter, but it's still mine. Now this is even cooler for me. Now I have actually two Porsches. But okay, I said you get one. So let's change that. And for this, I will now change the owner. So I will sell my second car. Okay, and I will sell it to Peter. Which means, I mean, I just made this method up before I assign the owner's name, the new owner. Okay. Also, by the way, I mean, here I'm using string to have this as simple as possible for our example. Usually I would prefer to have this a proper object also, like name, for example, and I also already have that here. Um, but in this fast example, I use string. But more object oriented would be if you have name as an object there. Okay, so I sell it to Peter and now I expect the test to be green. Let's try it again. Okay, it's green, it worked. But now I have a fear. What if now my Porsche would not be mine anymore? So on top, I want to assert that the original Porsche is still mine. Porsche of Marcus to the original Porsche. Okay. Which also worked. And this tells us now, starting from my Porsche, Marcus, I called the clone method. It created a new object in memory. And this new object was assigned to the reference Peter's Porsche. I asserted that they're not the same object, two different objects. And then I changed the second object and I gave it the owner of Peter. So, and I asserted that now the owner's name is Peter by comparing the string. And second, I asserted that what I was working on, the second object, the copy, was not influencing my Porsche. So this is like proving that our clone operation did work. But now let's look at the code, what we needed to do for this. I had to say implement clonable. I had to override the clone method. I had to call the super clone method. I had to catch the clone not supported exception. This is a lot of lines for only this. And actually there's more to it. Because actually what this does is it creates only a shallow copy and not a deep copy. Now again, this is a more advanced topic. So I try to keep this as short as possible. What's the difference between a shallow copy and a deep copy? Okay, 
Well, a deep copy for this, I have prepared here a more complex object, BMW. And here I'm using actually the object name. And I'm even using a second object, color. And let's make this a bit bigger so you see more. A deep copy would mean that not only BMW is copied, but also all the objects inside of BMW are copied. So they, that they are also independent, that they're not referencing the same object. But a shallow copy will here only copy the reference and the object for name as well as the object for color will still be the same objects for a shallow copy. Sometimes this is okay and sometimes it's not. It really depends on your implementation. However, in short, if you, using clone, want to make a deep copy, you will also have to call clone on the internal objects. And this here I have prepared. So here I'm calling clone actually three times. Now, one more problem of the clone method is, what I'm actually doing here is, first of all I clone BMW and then on this attribute and this one, which is already fully functional, I assign a new value, which only works if this is not final. So it turns out that to in order to make a deep copy, it only works if your internals are not final and sometimes you want them to be final. So this is really a limitation of uh, the clone method. And also, I mean, how complicated it is, is not so nice. Okay, um, and for this, there are alternatives, I told you. I've written here a lot of code. Um, I have written this code so I could show you, but I think, um, yeah, I would want to make this episode not as long because I noticed many of you are only watching like the first minutes. So 95% will already be asleep anyway. So let's keep this short. So, in short, let me show you alternatives to using the clone method. There are two, two alternatives. The first alternative is using a so-called copy constructor. And this is this thing here. The copy constructor has one parameter and this is the same object. And then you see here, I say new name on owner's name, new color on bmw.color. So I'm taking the internals and I'm creating new objects on it. And so in the end, I will have a new object that has the same values as the original object. This is one alternative. The other alternative would be, and this is actually my preferred one, to use a so-called static factory method. And this is this here, it's a static method. So you can directly say BMW as the class name dot new instance. You can give it the BMW object you want to copy. So in this case, probably Marcus BMW. And then here you see, I again call the constructor new BMW, but here this is a more complex object. So I have to recursively, we call this recursively, because again I say new instance and here also new instance. And I have to again call those methods to also cop copy the owner's name, because now I'm actually doing a deep copy. I could have also just assigned the values, this would be a shallow copy, but it's safer to have deep copies. Okay. So, and for this we can also have a short look into name and color, because there, again, I do the same thing. Here I have my new instance method. So this is taking a parameter of name and then says new name, first name dot last name. Now first name and last name are both strings and strings are also objects. So why do I not need to copy them? Okay, now it gets more and more complicated, I'm sorry. Um, 
thing is, a string is an object, but it's actually an Im immutable object. And immutable means um, whenever you change the object, like you assign instead first name Marcus, you say Peter, you will not influence the other reference, but instead whoever said make this Peter will get a new object. So this was really helpful. And for string, this is um, done for you. Actually, you can do this for your own objects too. And in order to achieve this, you just have the limitation that you don't offer any method to the client that allows the client to change your values in here. But instead, you will always, for any change, return a new instance. And then you have an immutable. For this, I have also here an immutable test, because there is another class that actually does it, which is big integer. Big integer is similar to an int that we already looked on. It's just a bit better, first of all, because it can work on ints of, well, at least theoretically, any length until your memory is full. And there you have operations to add and subtract, for example. Now, when you say one, add one, this is returning a new object too, but the original object will not be influenced by this operation. You can also subtract, but everything that you call, every method that you call will never influence, will never change how the object looks. So it's created once with the constructor. This will like assign one to it. But after this, you can never ever change it again, which is very helpful in many cases. It's really a good design principle to um, use immutables whenever possible. Um, yeah, and it's also very good to use immutables when you do code multi multi-threading. Um, we haven't talked about multi-threading yet. We will at a later time, but their immutables are also very helpful. They will make everything more easy. So maybe you take one more thing with you from this episode, and this is favor immutables. Try to design your objects, your classes in a way that they are not mutable, that they cannot be changed after they were created. Okay, here I did the same thing with string. Maybe I can show you. So I call, so I assign twice hello, which in memory is ex actually the same object. But when later on here I say hi, this will influence the string one and not influence the string two. Let's execute this shortly. So you see, let's make this bigger so we can see both. A little bit bigger even. Okay. So now I see the first string here printed high, the second string printed hello. And so they're not equal. The first one has hi and the second one has hello. And if I remove this, this is why I had commented it out. Let's execute it again. Of course, now they both have hello. So that's the difference. And this is one example of an immutable. Strings are by definition immutable. Maybe we could also call this here. So. I print out in the end 0, 1, and 2. And also I asserted here a few things. So the int value of 1 is 1, the int value of 2 is 2, and the int value of 0 is 0. While I'm operating on these objects, they will always return a new object, return a new object, they will not influence the original object. This is an immutable. This is something that you should try always to achieve. Okay, let's go back to clone. Let's recap. 
So, in order to properly use clone, you have to, first of all, override the clone method so that it is public. Second, you don't have to, but it's recommended. Use not object here, but use the type of the class that you're in. Then you will have to do an explicit cast to the class here. Catch the clone not supported exception, throw a new assertion error, which will show you in case you forgot to implement clonable, which you will also have to do. However, what this is going to achieve, it will create a shallow clone for you, which means if there are objects that are not immutables and you then operate on those objects, this can break another object because still you're not totally independent, you're only partitionally independent, you're only on the first level independent. But if here you have name, this would only copy the reference and the object here would still be the same. If you also want to achieve this, you have to implement a more complex clone method. You have to also call clone on the internal objects and then assign the new cloned values to your internal attributes, which will only work if they are not final. So this already limits the way you can implement your code. See, this is not working now. So, and this is one of the ver uh, one of the many sorry, one of the many reasons why you should not use clone, other than to clone an array. And I showed you two alternatives. One is use a static factory method. I called it new instance. Same like Josh Block in Effective Java that you should buy. And here. I call the constructor and again recursively I call again a factory method on name and again a factory method on color, which even creates a deep copy. Or I can do the same thing with a constructor, but you see this is actually shorter. So this is why I would prefer to use the factory method. But it both works. Okay, so here I call twice a new constructor, I create a new name object and I create a new color object. Okay, and then in name we can also look. Here you see I do the same thing and this now is strings and I set strings. Now we don't have to call clone because a string is immutable. So you have to do this recursively until you reach either an immutable object or a primitive. If this were again like first name object, we would ha have to continue with cloning or copying like calling the constructor until you reach either a string or a primitive value or another immutable object. See here I also implemented clone. And then we can also look at color one last time. For all of them I have done the three different implementations. Here with a static new instance method, here with a clone method, and last but not least here with a copy constructor. It receives a color object and then it retrieves the string from the original object, which is a string which we don't have to clone any further. Okay, good. So I think that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, I would be very, very happy if you could give me a thumbs up on this video in YouTube. Um, then you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And last but not least, um, add a comment to the video, tell me what you liked or did not like, that would be really nice. Okay, so thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.